Uh, so resilience and well-being will be the theme, um, and I'm sure all of you have thoughts about um, how parks contribute to resilience and well-being. I was um, mentioning to a park uh, manager just a few moments ago. Uh, you know, I am. I love. I love parks in every city I go to. I use them a lot. Um, recently, I was reminded about how different parks perform such a different functions because my stepdaughter. Uh, has two toddlers, one four and one one year old, and when I go over to help uh, help her out with them, we end up going to this park that I've never really thought much of. It's at the corner of Arbutus and Seventh, and it's like a tenth of a block or something like that. I always thought, what is the point of this? You know, it's useless. Uh, it is so well used. It is her lifeline. Um, she doesn't need a huge park. In fact, a big park wouldn't work for her. It's just perfect for her and a whole raft of parents who show up with their kids there. Um, and it's clear it's a very diverse community. I hear a lot of languages there. People have clearly met there. Um, and it performs a, a fantastic community function on that tiny little plot of land that has enough room for, like I think, a sandbox, one set of swings, some kind of climbing device, and one other thing. That's it. That's all there is there. And it's just this loved community resource. So um, we're going to hear lots more um, than that uh, tonight when talking about resilience and well-being. But that was, for me, an illustration of the role that parks perform. So um, our first speaker is John Atkin. Uh, so I'll get you to come up, John. <laughs> slowly while I read out your illustrious biography. Um, so John, of course, uh, is a former City Hall employee. That's how I first got to know him. The person I would phone whenever I needed to know anything about the history of Vancouver whatsoever. Can you dig up some photograph for me of some hotel that burned down in 1924 on Main Street, somewhere I think near Georgia? Um, and he would inevitably be able to do it. Um, he uh, is now happily retired from the city and a civic historian, writer, and walking tour guide um, who uh, uh, also um, publishes some books about Vancouver, co-publishes books. Um, he's worked with uh, Michael Kluckner on two of his books and he also has worked on Changing City, which is both a book and a blog um, with Andy Copeland. Uh, the current chair of the Chinese Canadian Historical Society and sits on the board of the Dr. Sun Yat-sen Chinese Classical Garden. Uh, so we'll hear first from John. Go ahead. The city hall part was a secret. But anyway. All right, so when I was asked to do this, um, I spent an awful lot of time just thinking about what in hell would I talk about in terms of resilience of parks. Well, parks, they survive if they're maintained. Well-being, well, parks make us happy for the most part. So then I thought, well, what would I talk about? And then I was thinking, well, this is a young city, and non-native settlements started here in 1865 or so, and we've always been an outward-looking city. Um, all of our great sort of spaces, Harbor Green down in Coal Harbor, False Creek, the South End, North Shores, are sort of great open space with big sort of um, edge to it so that you're always looking outward. And Stanley Park, of course, is one of those great sort of inward spaces, but mostly everyone sticks to the seawall and looks outward. So if you imagine the city 25 years from now, density and sort of the growth into some of our single family neighborhoods and things, I was thinking, well, what would we do? Well, in the past, we are a commercial city. There was no thought to providing park space because why would you waste valuable land on stuff that isn't productive? And so much of the city's early history in terms of developing public space has been carving out public space outside of Stanley Park, out of existing areas, be it Falls Creek and industry, or in this case behind us here, uh, this is one of many proposals for that long lost and never happened civic center. This one starts at Hastings at Victory Square and goes all the way to Georgia. And so they were just gonna take out a huge swath of houses and other property to try to create that grand civic space. I think we already have the grand space, Stanley Park, the Creek, etc. And so if we progress and move forward, I think one of the things that would be interesting would be to think smaller. 
Because as I walk around the city, and I like poking in this city, other cities, I take a group to London every year just for fun, and we're always in those strange, odd spaces. And so this is Gasworks Park, um, or Gasholder Park, which is a new piece in London up in King's Cross. One of the old cast iron gas holders has been restored, rebuilt, and there's a park inside it. This is where you can sit, look outwards, and see the canal and the various buildings. But it's also, in a big open space, it's also very enclosed because it's actually got a colonnade of mirrors. And so as you look into the park, you can't actually sometimes see out. You see yourself, you see reflections of other things, and so it's incredibly complex. But it has a sense of enclosure. And so it's this idea then that you have big space, but I think as the city grows, and especially when we get to 100 years from now, we won't recognize the place, but also I think that sense of enclosure, that sense of working with smaller spaces, I think is the future for parks. You have, and this is what I imagine Robson Square to be in 100 years, I think. This is a park in Tokyo. Uh, we were walking through um, Tokyo, just one of those long day rambles, and this was a huge hole in the ground. We're actually standing on top of a bunch of shops that's overlooking this great sort of fountain with man-made elements in it. It's also got this incredible sort of what seemingly natural rocks and planting and things. And this roar of water blots out the train stations next to you, blots out everything else around you. And you get that real sense of enclosure as you walk deep into this great hole. And I was thinking about Robson Square because it's three blocks long, and it's got fountains that are never turned on. It's got great gardens and a few hiding spots. But I keep thinking that it could be better and more different in terms of it should be more of a ruin. And I think as the city progresses, I think we should look at those sort of leftover spaces, those sort of ideally ruined spaces that might actually occur, and also take advantage of spaces that we don't think about. This is actually the courtyard of the Parks Board. And if you sit in the Parks Board meeting room uh, and you, or the chamber, you look out into this lovely, almost Japanese-inspired uh, garden. It sits in between two wings of probably the best West Coast modernist building in British Columbia, which is the Parks Board headquarters. But you don't know about this space. You can't get to the space. You can't even really easily, without feeling like you're really trespassing, sit around the pond. But it's actually a well-designed space because it actually has a screen that runs around the edge of it. If you've actually made that rain screening, then you can actually sit chairs out there. You could actually sit in the rain and read. You could actually get out into that space and use it. And going smaller and really sort of pulling things in so that we're actually contemplative space. You know, it's, it's lovely to go down to False Creek and sit. David Lamb Park, look out, watch the boats go by and things like that. But it's also looking outward. And I think we need to start looking inward. And I spend a lot of time with the city poking in the corners. And I think it would be fun to sort of start developing a very different language of park space. And London, of course, with bomb damage from the Second World War, has an extraordinary amount of really interesting creative spaces. This is actually in East London. This is Cleary uh, Park. It's actually the foundations of an old warehouse. And so instead of demolishing everything and filling the hole in, they cleared the site and left the warehouse walls standing, and you actually come down very deep into the site. And then you have a garden, colonnade, arbors, and in the springtime, you get this great planting everywhere. And again, you're enclosed, and you don't know the cities around you. And it's this sense of enclosure that I find actually quite a lot of pleasure in just sort of sitting, thinking, and not being distracted by everything else around us. And so I think as the, again, take the city out 100 years in this incredibly dense place that we'll probably develop, it'd be really fun then to use those nooks and crannies and develop these interesting and almost too small spaces. And I think that's one of the things, is that we think big, and I think we should really flip it and think really small. And so I'll leave you with this image. This is my favorite two-person table at a coffee shop I'm not going to tell you where it is because I don't want people in there. Um, but it's actually in the light well between a building, two buildings. And it's the light well in the building. Their office is on one side, coffee shop on the other. You have to go in past the kitchen, out through the milk crates, sit this in here. And then what you have is office workers in one side, people passing through the courtyard going to other things. But it's one of those lovely little spaces that actually works as a public space. 
if, even though it's a coffee shop, but it's that kind of miniature space. And I love just sitting there, notebook in hand. I may never write anything, but it's a space that I really enjoy. And I think smaller, tighter, weirder, and using sort of the ruins of the city that will, it will become. Thanks. Uh, so our next speaker is Dr. Larry Frank, um, uh, as someone, again, that I've, uh, had a, I've been fortunate to interview many times. Uh, a, a, a lot to do with his uh, interesting groundbreaking research on, um, you know, the way that uh, suburban settings uh, appear to foster obesity and health problems. Uh, in, in all kinds of ways and um, other research about the way the structure of cities, the, the layout of cities affects our health. Um, he is, of course, the Professor of Sustainable Transportation and Public Health at, uh, U, uh, at UBC and the President of Urban Design for Health. Uh, and I didn't know this, that you coined the term walkability uh, in the early, but you didn't, you didn't come up with walk score, no? Yes. Did you? Walk score is yours? Okay, wow. That, because I see that now uh, in so many places when they're advertised. Um, evil Airbnb or houses for sale or whatever. Um, and he's co-authored co two of the leading books, Health and Community Design and Urban Sprawl in Public Health, uh, which helped to map out the field emerging uh, at the nexus between built natural and social environments and health. So, Larry, on parks. Good evening, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I have to tell you, I'm actually gonna present stuff that is new to me, and I'm reading it through a mirror reverse, so if I, if I talk and the words, <laughs> if, I, if I say stuff like makes no sense at all, that would be, that would be why. So, uh, so far I can see that, that's a picture. <laughs> okay. So, um, I wanna mention, I, I live in a neighborhood in Vancouver um, called Douglas Park. I don't know how many have heard of Douglas Park, but it's named after our park. And I learned a lot from this park, a couple of things. It validated kind of what I thought is the way open space recreation affects our behavior. The park is right nearby and it has a running track around it that's perfect. So I'm now, when we move there, running more. So we do all these studies on movers and how changes in environment, we call them interventions, affect behavior. It really does, it makes total sense. So um, I, I have friends that tease me and say, you get paid to do that? We, we already know that, you know, but, but we actually, <laughs> We don't really make that much doing, I can tell you that, but it's worth, the, the evidence matters because, and I'm gonna show three studies. We learn a lot from the evidence and we can learn what works and what doesn't work when we make new investments. So um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a study. E.O. Wilson is an ecologist uh, from Georgia, actually, and biophilia, sort of contact with nature. So a lot of my work is more, as Francis mentioned, on built environment, but built natural and social factors all matter. So this park I live near, I learned another thing about it is scale. And I think Francis, really, you touched upon this a lot. Douglas Park is about an, a, a kilometer all the way around it. It's big enough to have s some activities, but not too, it's locally serving versus regionally a uh, destination. So we live near Queen Elizabeth Park. That doesn't create social capital and sense of community in any neighborhood. It's a wonderful destination, and it's, a, it's, a, it's essential that we have such amenities but the scale of Douglas Park and other parks of similar size, I think, are big enough to be our local destination, locally serving, and that's, I think, fosters a lot of community engagement and support. So, um, so there, there's a real need for, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a study that we've done in, uh, it's called the Green Infrastructure, um, or uh, it's called Green Prescription uh, in Sacramento. So the first, the first uh, uh, study I'll present is that. So what's happened in, in the research side is, as you know, there's now more and more evidence where people are connecting things like health outcomes, like chronic disease, diabetes, and cardiovascular disease, and other factors, it could be depression, linking that directly with the provision of open space and other amenities, when also thinking about the opportunities to get to destinations, shops and services and transit, because we need all those factors working together. And for what population, young, old, rich, poor, how do these things work and what do we each value? So I have to turn my head as I, as I present some of this because I can't read backwards that fast. So um, this is really, we're basically investing in green infrastructure is increasingly important, uh, obviously because of the benefits and decades of research indicate exposure, you know, reduce stress, promote restoration, and improve mental health, but there really hasn't been a lot of quantification of it or how much, and what's the cost benefit of investing in, in green, you know, we have to make the business case often uh, in order to get money to do things relative to other competing 
uh, environment, uh, competing things. So green prescription is a study that was done in Sacramento where we took a California health interview survey data set where we had people's, a lot of different observations, like 6,000 people or maybe 7,000. We published this in a journal called Health in Place about two years ago. We learned a lot. Um, what we learned is basically exposure to natural and green space helped you. And this isn't just parks and open space. This is the density of the tree canopy. So it's if you live on streets that have trees, if you know sort of how green your neighborhood is. And it's really tree canopy is the measure that we took out of the aerial imagery, high resolution. So this is an advancement in science. We now have flyover data that's really good information that it correlates very well, as we showed, I think, for when the first time with physical activity and obesity. So in basically, in a nutshell, we found a 10% uh, a increase in tree canopies associated with an 18% reduction in obesity. So it makes you think, well, how do trees make you thin? You know, and it, <laughs> they don't. Um, it's actually, <laughs> it's a function of physical activity in part, but there's other factors that go with street, nice streets with nice trees have wealthier people. Uh, they have better pedestrian amenities and all those other things that go with it. So that's the key. But basically, we looked at encouraging physical activity, reducing stress, all the other things. Um, I have a lot of concern about, I don't think trees actually really, and I'm sure I'll get, someone will challenge me for this, but trees aren't really the best way to clean the air. Sorry. They're, 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 you know, they can help filter out a little bit of air pollution. Trees don't block much no vegetation and noise. These things don't work so well, but trees do a lot in terms of making people feel better, and vegetation does as well. Cooling, definitely. A lot of mechanisms are very tractable. Some aren't. Um, uh, and I think the social capital piece is critical because it's a place to be, uh, so open space and, and public realm. So, this study, we identified the impact of tree canopy and understanding health-related benefits of tree planting for cities. So here's our results. Uh, it was on adults. We have a youth paper coming out soon, but basically it showed more vigorous activity, less obesity, less asthma, um, uh, better general health, and better social cohesion. The asthma might be related to other factors, not necessarily the vegetation itself. itself. Uh, for teens, you can see less obesity, better general health, fewer depressive syndrome, sim symptoms, and for children, again, obesity down and better general health. So, um, so that's, this is mapping in Sacramento, just showing uh, the tree canopy uh, cover. But basically, we monetized it and, uh, for adults, teen and youth, uh, teens and children. And you can see, for an average, for over uh, annual health cost savings per 1,000 people. So you can start to do some comparison. So we do cost of illness. So if you're reducing a certain amount of chronic disease, well, chronic disease costs money, and we monetize that. It's a lot of the work we do at Urban Design for Health and at UBC is to bring the dollars forward to understand, to make the business case for investing in parks and walkability and in places that, are, that produce physical activity and healthier people. So this is more data than I'm going to show you. Um, uh, you don't need all that, but if you want more information, I'm happy to share it. That's the numbers behind the last table. So the green prescription, the implications for decision makers is trees provide shade, uh, obviously aesthetic appeal, play space, and noise and pollution filtration. I disagree with that really being very effective in urban areas. And findings suggest that it's really uh, tree planting and maintenance programs can provide and be a cost benefit solution to promote health. Um, so another thing is important is sense of community. I wanted to talk a little bit about this. I don't have much time, but the built environment, walkability, that thing that um, was mentioned earlier, um, that led to walk score through our maps published in the Seattle Times, and a guy named Matt Lerner picked up the idea, and we worked with them to build walk score in about 1990, in the late 90s, is um, really identifying this is the impact of neighborhood design on sense of community, physical activity, uh, and neighborhood perception. And, uh, we basically did this. So sense of community, social capital is another way to think about it. Obviously critical uh, factor people care about is tied to, and this is the thought model, a little academic for this time of night, but I am an academic. So, uh, and it is this time of night. <laughs> Can't help it. So uh, demographic factors, uh, individual characteristics, build form. So, you know, and think of, just read the, the bold one, but basically who you are, and your individual preferences, your self-efficacy, intentions, motivation, what we prefer, those factors affect our behavior. And so does the physical environment where we live. And that's always been the debate. People say, well, you know, people just self-select to live in these places. It's all about attitudinal predisposition. It is not, and we've proven it. That's not the case. Uh, built form matters, and we have different people with different characteristics living in neighbor the same neighborhood. We can measure the difference, and we have. So that, that game's over. No one's saying that anymore to us. 
that basically that's affecting you know, walking within the neighborhood. If you walk more, the theory is you would know your neighbors, possibly, um, we hope. And, that, and then again, that, and the built environment affects your perception of the neighborhood. Overall, that affects sense of community. So it's important to be thinking about what affects what. So this study looked at uh, the frequency. We just looked at how much do people walk, and then how well do they know their neighbors based on where they live. So we looked at leisure walking and then brisk walking. And uh, we found basically um, in this study, and I don't have the, the, uh, the results just to show you, but I, know, I remember quite well it was published in Social Science and Medicine in 2010, and it's been pretty widely cited. And I think the reason is it's the only study to really operationalize, to put together a set of factors around a built environment, but sense of community, many different measures of how you can measure how well someone knows their neighbor um, and, and, their, and their community. And we found significant positive relationships for people living in, walkable, in neighborhoods with walkable retail, uh, where shops and services are built up to the street, uh, but we found an inverse opposite relationship, mixed use neighborhoods that have car-oriented retail actually reduce social capital, in fact, significantly so. So having people coming in and out of your neighborhood and going to a strip little commercial, even though it's a shop uh, or whatever there is, is not gonna help. So it's walkable retail is what does it with parks and green space all matter. And we have another paper that just looked at the green space side of that coin and found just recently very significant relationships for elderly, elderly who live in communities that have more, that's this study, um, with more green space, have more social capital, and the mechanism is having that green space, that, that public realm is the pathway. You need that space for seniors to know each other better and have shops and services as well that complement that green space. So the old model of a, of, a, of a traditional community with a green space in the middle, with the parks and the retail wrapped around it, that's a mixing of uses. We need to redefine mixed use to have the green in it. So, um, and, and I think that's so what we studied here was this green space. We're gonna do this on youth because we think youth will have a very similar result. Um, so, uh, but basically what we're finding in measuring sense of community is that um, uh, access to parks uh, is critical um, and uh, presence of street trees and natural sites matter. Higher pedestrian safety is positively associated with increased social capital, social cohesion and tree line street, uh, and uh, street tree presence and higher pedestrian safety is positively associated with increased social interaction and reduced distance to parks. Final point, and this is something that's totally, I couldn't resist to show you. We just learned about a half, this is a few months ago, that active transportation infrastructure is good investment. For every dollar spent on active transportation infrastructure we found in Los Angeles yields $8 back to the economy through reduced healthcare costs, increased workforce productivity uh, is really the big, the big buck. So we're gonna be learning that the, dollar, that the actual um, ability to do that, the, the actual um, uh, payback is there on the economic side. So, Infrastructure for pedestrians, green space, and, and, and walkable shops and retail are our future for a more sustainable society. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker is Bill Peckett, um, who is both an artist and um, a teacher of architecture at UBC. Uh, I don't know if many of you know this. I only discovered it a few years ago when I met Bill socially, but he and his partner, Stephanie Robb, designed those fingers beside the Canby Bridge that tell you how energy is being used um, in the Olympic Village. So that's an example of utilitarian um, public art or useful, pub no, I don't want to say utilitarian, but useful public art. Um, also uh, uh, worked with her on um, uh, an art project for the 2006 Venice Biennale called Sweater Lodge. Uh, which you should Google, and uh, I, I'll never do it justice by trying to describe it. Uh, but um, at UBC, he does design studios at all levels in architecture and environmental design uh, with special concern for uh, or contemporary urban social practice and the way in which materials and space impact the experience of the built world. So, Bill. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thanks for inviting me here tonight. I'm going to uh, shamelessly use this as an opportunity to tout my own work, just as a forewarning. Um, when I began uh, to think about this lecture, I, uh, I did a quick little definition search on the nature of resilience, and one of the first images that came up was um, the Wolverine from X-Men, 
who, if you don't know this character, um, can die and come back to life as many times as he wants. Um, another definition of, of resilience uh, looked at the idea that um, it means the ability of a substance to have elasticity or flexibility. And then um, continuing on with the movie theme, um, the notion that well-being is the state of being comfortable, healthy, or happy. And so um, I, I found a, I was trying to dig a little deeper into the nature of, of well-being, and I found uh, five nice definitions from the University of Toronto um, Health and Counseling Center that looked at the idea of taking notice with things around you, uh, to be active, to continue learning, to connect with others, and to give opportunities for giving back to your community. So um, recently, I uh, gave a talk to my students up at UBC, and I was trying to explain a bit about my methodology. And uh, the title of the lecture was Puppy Dogs and Marshmallows. And as funny as that seems, well, at least I think it's funny, um, it was a way of kind of disarming the normative idea that what we do is heroic and rather to target things that elicit uh, senses of, um, of comfort, of humor, and, of, um, and a form of bouncing back um, and a, a form of uh, deriving pleasure from the things that, that in our world that produce comfort. And I think that goes to the heart of this notion. So um, I gave them a couple of dictums to work with as a designer, that uh, every situation has at least two sides, which means to be empathetic and to listen to multiple points of view. Um, to see the strange and the familiar, uh, we're often given almost no budget to work with, and so how do we invent with what we have just all around us to play with? Um, and many of my favorite um, ar architects and artists are masters at that. Um, but also, um, to, to several points we've already heard tonight, John's, discussion about scale um, is to find um, you know, worlds within the miniature. This is a blow up of, of sand. Or at least to think about scale in the urban setting as a constituent of something that you want to play with. So um, I'm going to let Charles Montgomery talk about how to make people happy. But I thought, no. <laughs> uh, but I thought in, in my role, when I enter into a project, it's more about making people feel a little bit better. Something, by the way, has happened with the font on this, and I never use a serif, so I just want you to know <laughs> this was all in uh, Helvetica when I sent it. <laughs> it's really affecting my performance. <laughs> um, anyways. Um, my practice engages in, in public art, uh, public spaces, urban infrastructure, lighting, cemeteries. Yes, they too can promote a sense of well-being, uh, memorials, and then the occasional house. Uh, one such project was done for the city of Winnipeg in 2012, which was a, um, the city had a, a, a fairly abject plaza behind the main central library, and we're in the process of rethinking it. So. I won a competition um, to create this piece of art and, um, and, a, and a fountain that's called Emptyful. And um, whereas it began as an idea that was mostly visual, because it's basically a two-dimensional drawing, it's only 1.5 meters thick, um, but suggests a lot of volume. What I realized when people were using it was that it had other characteristics that almost transcended its visual, and that it was that they took delight in the flowing of water and also of participating in the fog on a hot summer's night. And moreover, it started to become a social center in the evening particularly. Oh, I only have five minutes left. OK. Um, <laughs> but not to underestimate the power that something um, astounding, if you could call it astounding, uh, can do in terms of eliciting and repairing uh, the public space of our city. Uh, this was one I did for Calgary that um, was on two sides of a freeway uh, where a new LRT station was recently built. This was just finished in 2015. And um, the piece is called Roger That, and it employs uh, 420 uh, solar-powered lights that are clustered together 
in what seem to be uh, random trees of, of shapes. But when you stand within the cluster and you look across the freeway, you notice that the one across from you becomes, it coalesces into a big giant circle. And this was explicitly done in the service of getting people to walk because you had to move in order to get the um, punchline, so to speak. Uh, we used the geometry of a, a famous philosopher, um, physicist Roger Penrose, hence the name Roger That. This was a piece I did in conjunction with PWL Partnership Landscape Architects for Hinge Park in the Olympic Village. And um, it was, uh, the brief just called uh, for a bridge, but we decided to exploit the idea that because this is a filtration uh, park, um, what happens to infrastructure when you no longer need it to carry uh, just, you know, drainage and, and sewers and, and things like that. Um, so uh, we decided to lift it and form that into a bridge and the traverse of that into a children's playground elicits um, not only sort of haptic experience but strong visual um, occurrences because of the dots of light. And another one that's just finishing in Richmond right now at Brig House Station uses 300 um, convex mirrors in order to paint a portrait of movement by the pedestrians who are coming back and forth on the train. And one just finished last year in, in Winnipeg called Heaven Between is a suspended dome that ha appears to have a candle uh, burning in the middle of it at night. But uh, the surprise is when you walk, again, the act of movement, you realize that the pattern that you thought was very random actually um, coalesces into a, a perfect um, geometry. Again, we worked with Roger Penrose on this one. And yet another one that's embedded into the, um, the glass wall of a new high rise on Nelson and Howe Street called Dicroic Vancouver uses a glass that changes color. So as pedestrians move down the sidewalk, what appeared to be aqua or blue at one point and then they turn and look back uh, becomes a, a lime green. And then at night it becomes a kind of kinetic light show. So, I mean, searching for all of these opportunities, this, Francis referred to this that I did with Stephanie Robb um, uh, in the year 2010, two minutes, um, was um, an attempt to humanize uh, an infrastructure that was on the brink of not being accepted by the community who live around the waste heat recovery plant. So when we came up with the idea that uh, what we really need is a high five, for Vancouver, uh, the vent stacks that were necessary. We, only, we didn't need five vent stacks. Um, in fact, it would have been accomplishable with many less, but um, the fingernails that change color there are an index of how much power is being required and the, the, the colors change according to whether the heat is, is glowing hot or, or cold. Um, our studio is always searching for ways uh, to imbue public space with new infrastructures that inculcate a sense of community and surprise. Uh, like this one we did for the Vancouver Parks Board in, 2000, in um, 1996, it's over 20 years old now, called Grand Table, which um, is the world's longest uh, public picnic table and can facilitate parties of up to 80 people. And another study we did for the Robson Business Improvement Association about how to close off Butte Street. They, they used this as a um, advocacy tool in order to close it this summer. And now they're looking at a more permanent solution. But we tested a lot of different activities against the space and illustrated how versatile it could be. And it's just a half a block. Same thing happened in the pier in North Van. We worked with Durante Cruick. Um, our, uh, landscape architects for over 10 years to mastermind a number of furnishings, lighting, public art pieces that all engage with um, the public in what we thought would be refreshing ways. This is my sink where I live. I won't talk about that, but again, it was an experiment. And then another experiment on uh, Granville Street where I worked again with PWL uh, to construct uh, this 10 block long visual vortex that was predicated um, on the idea of illuminating something about special about Granville Street, which is that it's so straight and you can see down it. Something as simple as that. 
but the color choice of a warm, a warm, warm white was an attempt to um, imbue it with a sense of uh, nostalgia and comfort. So thanks very much. Talk to you later. Um, so our final speaker is um, Charles Montgomery, who um, I had the good luck to sit beside at the grubby old Vancouver Sun building at 6th and Granville mm, 30 years ago. <laughs> oh, sorry, sorry, 25. <laughs> uh, and Charles uh, did something that uh, made him the envy of every journalist in that room, which is he moved on from doing routine stories about you know highway car crashes and city council meetings and developed a real passion uh, for something and turned that into not just a career but you know uh, a, a lifelong project and a passion. Um, so uh, he did that, he started off by uh, writing a book called Happy City, Transforming Our Lives Through Urban Design. Um, that book really became the platform for um, a consultancy um, employing um, a number of people uh, that uh, looks at uh, how to uh, use research from psychology, neuroscience, and public health uh, to create more resilient cities. Um, Charles travels around the world, um, talks to people in different cities uh, about how to make change. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to hear what you have to say on this um, subject in particular. I've decided to conduct an experiment called uh, taking artists Helvetica away from them and seeing what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Bill. Um, first of all, in this uh, time of change and reconciliation, I just want to acknowledge that you know, we're on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil Tooth. And uh, much of the work that the Parks Board uh, and the City of Vancouver will be doing over the next couple of decades will, will influence or be influenced by uh, what is happening in the, in the First Nations milieu. So um, that's, that's going to be interesting for all of us. Um, also, I. I've learned from every one of these speakers uh, who spoke before me through the years, including you, Francis, so it's a real delight for me to be here. I'm gonna speak really quickly to keep my presentation to 11 minutes. Um, someone said I was supposed to define happiness. I'm not so good at that anymore. I'm often quite grumpy, but uh, I think a couple of key words here are, are uh, yes, resilience, um, access to nature, um, inclusion and equity. And I want to touch on some of those. Uh, and I'm going to talk about some things that bug me and inspire me. Um, and I, I think I was inspired in the last year and actually this past week uh, with a couple of stories. And I'm going to call them Two Paths to Happiness. And I can't see anything in this crazy mirror. So um, I'm going to look over my shoulder too. Um, okay, Two Paths to Happiness. Uh, everybody here has heard of the Smart Cities movement, right? Dubai's really into this. Everything is smart now, and all of a sudden they have a new minister responsible for happiness in the UAE, so their smart cities work is also uh, happy. Everything is happy all the time. And so it manifests like this, and one of their uh, big public parks, uh, Zabil Park, there's a happiness market, so isn't that great? And I'm supposed to love that, so I jumped up and down, and then we got in line to get into this park. And um, it took us 20 minutes to get inside, and we were wondering, what is going on? Well, the problem was there was a smart city solution. Now you need a smart card to pay your entry fee to get into the, into the park. So that's a smart city thing. Um, why do you have to pay an entry fee to get into the, one of the best par public parks in the city, and a truly, supposedly public park? Well, if they don't charge an entry fee, the park will be full of uh, laborers from South Asia because there's a million of them in the country. And they just don't want to share their park space with those people. They want to keep them over here where they supposedly belong. So that's where the smart city movement is headed and we all need to be really careful. Um, okay, so let's take a look at another perspective. Here's someone who really inspired me. I met her in Vienna a couple of years ago. Her name is Eva Kale. She uh, basically uh, invented a concept known as uh, gender mainstreaming in urban planning. And uh, I was like, I have no idea what that is, and it sounds really intimidating for me, being who I am. And so I took her workshop, and we wandered around Vienna and saw how they did this remarkable work. And the premise was simple. Make cities work, make public space and parks work for women. And I'm like, so you mean everyone? And she's like, no, 
We need to make these spaces work for women. And then, then they will probably work for everybody a lot better. So some of the work they did was uh, doing tours of old ladies around neighborhoods, seeing what worked and what didn't. But when it came to parks, they actually um, did a lot of analysis and noticed that you know, girls weren't using parks in Vienna. They were taken over by you know, teenage boys who are you know, rough and ready and they're just very loud. And so they studied what was working, what wasn't working, and they basically redesigned parks to make them work for girls and make them less fearful to use those spaces, more comfortable. I won't go through all the interventions, but one on the top left, and those uh, seem to be fully grown uh, adults, but this notion that uh, they notice that girls like to come to a space and take a look uh, from a viewpoint at the entire space before diving in. So they built these higher spaces and benches so girls could have that opportunity. That's just one intervention. So I thought that was pretty cool. And um, uh, an inspiration that I think goes in tandem with their work it was conducted uh, by these fellows in Copenhagen. Um, Henrik and Adam, perhaps, were their names. There were a couple planners. I had my computer stolen by a, a famous street artist in Vancouver, so I lost the images of their work. Um, but um, I hope his book is successful. Um, anyway, their work is really amazing. They were working on a public park in Norbro. I can't speak Danish, Norbro. And uh, they, they talked to everybody, right? They did the engagement, and it was all great. And the neighbors spoke, and you know, stakeholders spoke. And they were just about to do their design, and they realized, oh, we forgot to talk to uh, what they called the drunks in the park. So they got a couple of cases of beer and went down to the park and talked to the drunks and said, what do you want? And the drunks were like, thank you so much. What we really want is not to bug everyone else. We want our own space. So they built them a kind of a fort where their dogs would hang out and they would do their own thing and drink and they wouldn't bother anybody else. So now the park really works for everyone. So that challenged, challenged me to think, can we, um, can we execute this philosophy of making places for everyone? Okay, so coming back to Vancouver, thinking about this notion of for everyone, can we do that here now and in the future? And, um, well, you know, uh, the Greenest City Action Plan is actually very concerned with these kinds of things. And now we see that, you know, around 92, 93% uh, of locations in the city are within a five-minute walk of, um, of green space. That might be a park or other green infrastructure. And that sounds really good until you think, well, wait a minute. It's not, it's, it's not what? Five minutes? Okay, I'm going to talk even faster. It's, it's about individuals and their access to space. It's not about a space's access to another space. And we have all this fantastic, world-renowned public space, beaches and whatnot, but so much of it is only accessible to a few people who live nearby. Um, if, if you don't live at uh, Jericho, it's really hard to get out there, but you know, thank God they built us a bike lane to get there from the east side. That does help people like me and the Bruntlets. So what happens if you live uh, in South Van, somewhere like you know, 220 East 58th Street? Um, how, how well is that um, uh, policy working for you, the five minute policy? Well, you look at a map here and five minutes away there's this gigantic green space. Awesome, you can walk there until you realize, well, of course, it's, um, it's, a, it's a golf course. So it's, it's basically a, some gated infrastructure. And um, when you look at Langara Golf Course, and actually I have to thank the, the Parks Board who provided me with uh, this data, uh, so they, um, it's $37 to get in. Uh, they have about 50,000 users a year. That works out to be 137 people a day. Well, I mean, that's nothing. This is, uh, how many, this is 50 hectares. So you get that many more people using Grandview Park, which is, you know, 5% of the size. So it made me think, you know, is that really the best use of our money? Um, okay, so let's just hold on to that for a sec. There's a barrier there to, public, to, to use of public space and parkland. Queen E Park, uh, I'll be moving up in that direction uh, when Little Mountain co-housing is done in, um, in a couple of years. So I'm really interested in Queen E Park, and you know, there's lots to do up there. You can take pictures and get married and stuff. Um, <laughs> Uh, and we can talk about the programming of the park, but what strikes me is when I try and get there from the east or the north, I mean, this infrastructure is from the 1950s, and it's set up for tour buses and people driving through, but try and walk up there, forget about it. Here's the access point from Hillcrest Community Center, the natural pedestrian access point. Uh, you don't want to send your kids up there, do you? So there's, it's, it's a very disconnected um, uh, place. So I thought, well, how about some sort of manifesto-like strategies that might help us get to more accessible, inclusive, um, and local uh, places? First of all, let's tear down the paywall. 
Um, here are our three public golf courses in the city of Vancouver. That's 15% of our park sp space that you've got to pay to get into. And it's more than 15% of the park space available in the south end of the city. So let's tear it down. Let's do other stuff. Fortunately, there are examples all around the world where people are, are, um, are converting, retrofitting golf courses into spaces that uh, can be used for many purposes and uh, attract a lot more people. Um, in um, uh, North Las Vegas, it's amazing. You've got your TP, your garden lodge, your baseball fields. It goes on and on and on. So instead of your Langara scene, I don't know, this maybe is a cold Tuesday morning. Where is everyone? Uh, you have something like this, which is accessible to more people. And, um, and it looks like a lot more fun to me anyway. I kind of like golf, though. Um, then uh, NOLA. There was a golf course called NOLA in... Um, in New Orleans, and they've turned it into uh, a community garden where kids from the local schools are being educated and taught to be leaders in gardening, green infrastructure. And they barely touch the edge of the park. They, they've got much more space to use. Uh, the next one, connect with neighbors. I mean, this is pretty obvious to me. Uh, we know on the left, Queen E Park, what are you gonna, supposed to do when that sidewalk ends? I don't know. Um, and then maybe we can be inspired by a place like Sacre Coeur in, uh, in Paris with a grand staircase that welcomes all of us, uh, or at least those of us who can climb stairs up, and, and look at other ways where people who maybe uh, don't have uh, strong thighs like me can make it up and feel extremely welcome in those spaces. Um, uh, thinking, uh, this is Prospect Park in Brooklyn, where you had a grand welcome as a pedestrian, and in summers now, or much of the year actually, it's, uh, it's uh, car free. So people feel free and safe to move around that place. Um, and then the other thing I thought, and this, you know, this, isn't, this doesn't touch Parks Board policy, but it, it certainly touches on a uh, concern all of us have. We need affordable housing in our city, we need more housing, and that housing needs to be near our best amenities. And the best thing we can do for parks is to give our parks more neighbors. So, you know, again, looking at an example like Jericho, thinking, you know, whew, you know, those people are pretty lucky, but I'd like to be lucky too. Let's have thousands more lucky people near parks infrastructure. Some of the best parks in the world that I've been to all have, uh, I would say, medium scale uh, density of housing overlooking them. And they just make the place safer, more comfortable, and more fun, and more traveled and healthy. Um, we've all been following this little debate in our poll about the modular housing and the woman who said, well, they should put it in Stanley Park. And I actually thought, well, that's a pretty cool idea, actually. Um, but maybe not in the park, because as the population grows, we need to protect the parkland. So, but what about beside the park? And then I thought, well, you know, down in Portland, if you look at some of the great parks in the Pearl District, They've got social housing right next door, mixed in with the, um, with the market housing. So it's being done elsewhere. So I think that woman had a great idea. And if you take apart Vancouver and look at the edges of some of our park space, including some of those uh, big uh, uh, golf course spaces and Pacific Spirit Park, I mean, we could uh, put in some missing middle or a little more dense housing all along those edges and make everybody healthier and happier. Finally, I'll just say, I've been totally ignoring your cards, but I'm not even at 10, am I? Hmm. Um, <laughs> um, I just, you know, the inspiration from Eva Kale and the inspiration from those fellows working in Copenhagen, for me, um, that's really the key. I haven't talked too much about programming or art or the science of, of how spaces get us moving, but we know that you know, social disconnection is a big issue in our city. We know that there's a relationship between social disconnection and, and resilience. So in other words, the more connected we are, the more we trust each other, um, the stronger places and neighborhoods we'll have. So it reminded me of one more example then. This is Granby Park in uh, Dublin or some Irish city. And um, to me, it's remarkable. Empty lot, they couldn't figure out what to do with it. Troubled neighborhood, nobody got along, people were fighting. And finally, an artist stood up, someone like Bill, brought the people together and said, you know, let's just do something ourselves. So they brought the neighbors together and said, well, what would you do if you had to build a park? What would you put there? And the cool thing about this is it's not elegant. It's not super pretty. But the act of building this space brought the neighborhood together, crossed social divides, brought people of different uh, income classes and different cultures together and created an extremely strong community bond there. And that's exactly what we're talking about when we're talking resilience. So I'm hoping this will open a conversation later tonight about how we can include more people in that, in that parks conversation. And um, yeah, thanks. Looking forward to our discussion. Thanks.
Okay, I guess I'm starting out. Um, so two themes that really stuck out to me from the talks was the importance of uh, incorporating green space into the formula for mixed space and the underperformance of some of the golf courses that we have. And so those were, I was wondering if we could start a conversation about how to tackle the housing crisis that we're dealing with by addressing uh, underperformance of some green spaces and incorporating housing into that mix. So uh, are you talking about actually putting housing on the park space or yes. around the parks? Around. Okay, because the, yeah. the first one would be, yeah. like I think, a lot more contentious than the second. <laughs> okay, so uh, housing around park space. So. Um, which Charles did address, uh, uh, you know, quite a bit, but um, others want to chime in on what the value of that would be? Um, we can just pass that microphone around there. What's that? Is that on? Oh, how do we do? So that's, um, think of Central Park in New York. The density around Central Park is quite high. The value is greatest near green space. So there's a good economic argument to do that. Um, people living adjacent, so there, there has to be some mechanism to deal with the, the upzoning and the backlash. Well, we have, we have city council, we have uh, elected officials here. Maybe mm -hmm. they should answer this question. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> so, so it's obvious the, the, where, you, where you invest in amenity, whether it be a train station, we want density near transit. We should have density near our amenities like green space as well, is what you're saying, so people, more people can enjoy it. That's but not point. just density. I think you were saying um, like subsidized housing. Well, more people. Yeah. means density. I mean, you, you, but, you, but also subsidized. Like, it can't be just... Mixed. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Right. Uh, important that you have a variety of income levels near there. Okay. But I'm curious to see what... I would like to see what a, someone who's uh, in a, an elected official response. I'd like to know what... So what are the barriers to that? Obviously, are resistance to that. Um, but is it worth overcoming it? We can overcome resistance with economic response, for sure. Uh, yeah. There's a health benefit. We can monetize the health benefits right away and show we can pay for it just through the health benefits of more proximity of more people, especially lower income people who are more likely to have chronic disease and depression to be near green space. We could show the economic benefit within about a week. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that there is, you know, a lot of discussion of that, more so right now around transit. Like people are starting to talk about there's a lack of planning to include subsidized housing around transit. Uh, and actually people who are lower income benefit the, boat the most by being close to transit. Um, yep. I, I'm around parks, it doesn't usually, it's not usually framed as a conversation as around parks. It's more framed as like how are we going to include subsidized housing in areas that we upzone, you know, for development. So Camby Corridor or Pearson Dogwood or uh, so on. Well, Los Angeles is part of its transportation bond initiative. Remember our referendum that didn't pass? Well, theirs passed. They have $170 billion to build transit and active transportation infrastructure, and they're using part of it to pay for affordable housing near all their train stations that they're building. So that's maybe an example we could look to. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Adrian. <laughs> yeah, I seem to be handed the mic. Um, so you know what? I think we should think about the the uh, what were experiments at the time that really worked in this line, and probably the best is False Creek South. Um, when you think about that, it was a, a conversion of an industrial area, but in a fantastic location with the False Creek and, and the sort of recapturing of False Creek as a real public amenity in terms of not, not necessarily park, but totally natural, um, sort of natural area. Uh, and, uh, and the plan at that time was one third, one third, one third. One third subsidized low income housing, one third middle income, one third market. And it's worked. I mean, it's going through redevelopment right now, but it, it, it really has worked. So, um, and I mean, the, the same sort of 
quote, experiment uh, was done around Olympic Village. Again, high profile area, great amenities, and the idea was to put social housing in the mix with high end um, there too. So I think the whole notion of, of including um, a mix of incomes in areas around the city is one that has worked really well, way better than what we're doing now in the city. Uh, although I think, uh, uh, you know, there's other people in the room who know this even better than I do. I think I saw Graham here. Or, uh, or, uh, but um, the Olympic Village example showed what happened when you try to do that, uh, replicate Falls Creek South, but the um, federal funding has been pulled away and there's less provincial funding. And so you're just not able to achieve uh, the same thing. So other quest other over there. And then I saw a hand in the middle um, back there after. Sorry, excuse me for pointing so rudely. Hi, good evening. Um, me, each of you spoke about uh, an element or an aspect that you focused on um, regarding the enhancement of parks and public spaces. So trees were one. Uh, inclusivity, of, in the par inclusivity of the parks was one. Um, making activities and putting housing on the perimeter. However, um, while those are all great factors into the implementation of increasing public spaces, we are going into this phase of where people are getting more involved with their work, less free time, and also the very obvious fact that Vancouver's raining most of the time. So are there any other, maybe, um, like for example, uh, Charles spoke about uh, Queen Elizabeth Park being kind of in the past, where we're in the future, but what if the park um, example, the park, uh, um, the park itself is, is, needs, needs to be upgraded, needs to be uh, more diversified in terms of providing, um, um, providing a reason to go there. Maybe, for example, I see a lot of people um, in the evenings, they go to restaurants, they go to places where there's a specific event. So this is clearly something that draws people to public spaces or non-public spaces. So what do you, what do you think are other maybe um, non-traditional um, motives that would drive people to use these parks given the fact that we're going into a different lifestyle given the weather and given the lifestyle of people in Vancouver? Thank you. Who wants to tackle that first? <laughs> yeah, uh, certainly, um, I've always thought that a giant covered space would make incredible sense for a city like Vancouver where you could use, um, we could call it a park, a plaza, or a larka, or something, but where you have a massive uh, roof to allow people to be out in the weather, coming together into the a, a mammoth social space that would offer all kinds of things. It seems like uh, something that, that, that would be a great gift to the entire city to construct something of that nature. Um, but I, I'm very lucky because I, I live right next to Stanley Park and so I'm always thinking about, you know, what. I, I listen to the people in my building and and observe how they use the park in different ways and what's brilliant about this particular corner of Stanley Park, which is right where the lagoon is, that there are so many different levels of engagement that somebody can have with the space. Uh, they could just sit on a bench and just look out over it, or if, you're, if you only have, like you said, we're busy, if you only have half an hour, you can do the lagoon walk. It's a circuit and you have a sense of completion and you get to visit with ducks and raccoons and people. <laughs> and, you know, uh, but it's kind of, I, I don't know if it's by design or by default, but it offers these different levels of engagement. And if you have more time, you could do the seawall or you could penetrate deep into the woods. But, um, but I think thinking about people's time and also their agility or their ability to, to move is critical um, when addressing this notion of access to all. And those of you who've worked in other cities, I mean, to get to her point about people 
are at work a lot. Um, do you see any signs that more parks are being designed to be close to people's workspaces so that they can use them at work? Um, or does it tend to be still a residential kind of, a largely residential phenomenon? I don't know if I can answer your question, but kind of following up on, on things Larry has taught us, um, we do some kind of meta reviews of, of work like Larry's and others, and, and on, on when it comes to the work aspect, I believe people who have a view of a green roof, for example, from their workplace are 50% more productive and they have a greater feeling of hope at the end of the day, <laughs> which I find wow. remarkable. And you see that happening, for example, around the High Line in, in New York City. So um, we encourage, it's funny, I didn't mention it when I spoke, but you know, this notion, I think uh, some of you mentioned it, and Larry, you focused on it, that <laughs> more nature in indoor spaces is great. Oh my Was God. it a mouse? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, a mouse in the house. It's gone now. It went that way. Oh, that's just for me. So, <laughs> um, it's funny, I was just going to mention the notion of, uh, of surprise and novelty. <laughs> so, we just all had this moment together and it's kind of wonderful, provided nobody got bit. So, we do encourage um, the notion of complexity. The more complex a place is, the more ha uh, opportunities there are there, the more reason people will have to go there. And, and if we can create more complex places closer to workplaces and closer to neighborhoods, then people who are working at home can, can get to them. I mean, to me, it seems really r pretty basic. But I think the one question was about um, you know, non-traditional uses or something. And I actually don't think our needs have changed that much in the last century. We still need green space, we still need to see other people, we still need places that are easy to get to and places that work for everyone. And just in terms of the unexpected, um, one of the delights of coming down to Robson Square and even tonight uh, walking in here, you come down the, the back stairs down to the ice rink plaza level and one of the things that you notice which is the unintended sort of use of the space are all the small dance groups that use the windows of UBC's campus to, as a mirror. And I occasionally do an extended learning course down here and it's very distracting when you're trying to <laughs> teach. And everyone's out there in yoga wear doing their dance moves. And so it's an interesting sort of use of space that no one could have programmed, no one could have thought of. Um, the ice rink was an afterthought as well because of course that was the transit station entrance and exit. So we're supposed to have a couple you know, 100,000 people a day walking across Robson Square. And so that's the unfortunate thing, that transit never took place. Um, but the sort of empty hole with the ice rink and then the dance groups and various other things, it, it becomes a lively space in spite of itself. And so I don't, sometimes the surprise, you can't predict and you can't program. And so I think if just having the space and making it accessible uh, lets things happen. And one of the nice things is no, there's no security guard that comes and chases the dance groups out. And so they get to thrive. Larry was going to say a little bit. Um, I, I was uh, thinking about your question, Francis, about having green space in your jobs. And mm -hmm. uh, we don't have a culture that prioritizes as much green space near transit. But the old village green, that's what that was about. You know, if you go to Santa Fe, still has a village green. The, the town's built all around a plaza. Spanish influence, but there's also that, you know, British comes from England as well. So that, that speaks to what are the, what could we do to incorporate some open space, but not just hardscape, but maybe some softscape green space around our transit stations. Something we don't think about because the economics seems so pie in the sky, far flung, but it might be the very thing that make those really work as villages as they develop and, you know, sort of we, we immediately dismiss it, but also setting buildings back a little bit. We know air pollution exposure is really bad along busy streets and it's much worse for people's health than we realize. So that having that setback, it comes at a cost, but that also may be another place where the argument is there from a health perspective is that air pollution exposure is very deadly for elderly. We have an aging population.
Okay, um, if you could just hang on to it. So the next um, person is the gentleman. Oh, you've got the microphone? Oh, great. What is that on your t-shirt? I can't tell if it's a full moon or an amoeba or what. It, it's actually a t-shirt from uh, the Chicago Museum of uh, Modern Art. It's the Murakami exhibition oh. that's gonna come to the VAG <laughs> okay. in February. Uh, everyone should go and see that. Um, and it's kind of related to my question here. So I, I'm clearly a transplant to Vancouver, I'm from the UK. I've traveled the world everywhere, like Tokyo and Paris, Copenhagen, wherever. There's one thing that I see on the streets that's beyond green space, and that's graffiti and guerrilla street art, you know, even guerrilla gardening. Um, we live in a city that's castigated people for any of those kinds of actions, even like places like Montreal and Toronto and, and, and really enjoy a vibrant sort of graffiti street art scene. Um, beyond green space and back into the urban back alleys and side streets. I live in Chinatown and we, we see people having to repaint and pay for painting over some humanity in the back streets every single day. What are your thoughts about happiness and the importance of, of the urban zones having a sense of freedom through uh, guerrilla action as well? Okay, who wants to tackle that first? <laughs> Okay, I'll start and give it to you. He's so thrown off by the no Helvetica, like we, we need to give him a breather. <laughs> uh, okay, uh, evidence-based answer. So a um, couple of folks on our team, uh, Mickey and, and Patty, were doing uh, research on, on uh, well-being effects of cultural expression. I mean, it sounds so dry. Basically, I'm, we're talking about things like culture you make yourself, or representations of place or culture and history. And uh, yeah, it's good for us. Creates a sense of belonging. Helps you feel like you're some place that's unique, that's yours. So very important to, cu to cultivate this. Interestingly for me, when uh, we were in Copenhagen, um, people were complaining in Copenhagen. And I'm like, what, you've got the best city in the world. Everybody says it's great. And the complaint was, yeah, but it's finished. And it, there's nothing to do or create here. And they pined for that, Bill. <laughs> A very, very good point, uh, Charles. I, I think uh, in all of this incredible frenzy of building that we're doing right now in our city, um, there doesn't seem to be an idea yet about building in a kind of relaxed corollary to all of that, which could be that kind of space that could be open for use. I mean, certainly the alleys, which is this parallel universe that is a gift potentially to our city, uh, could operate that way in the sense that they, in many ways, might be able to offer uh, for those who don't find that kind of thing beautiful or worthy, uh, could find um, a great space for that to occur and to allow uh, that kind of a free expression enacted on the public realm as a site. Uh, but I think it's incredibly difficult to build um, those into new projects because the, the processes that go into creating them and the, the, the fear that goes along with uh, the attachment of them to marketing campaigns and, you know, it's really hard to fight for beauty basically. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> nice dig. <laughs> I, I mean, and, and also just, it takes a really different mindset on the part of politicians to allow that. I mean, uh, it's not just in new projects that there's anti-graffiti campaigns in Vancouver, it's everywhere, and yet one of my favorite places in Marseille is Place Julien, which is just covered with graffiti everywhere, uh, and it's become a place that people want to visit because it's so interesting with all of that. But I, I can't imagine, at this point, a council that could relax its sphincter enough to let <laughs> that happen. <laughs> uh, you know, I, I'd love to see it, but I, I, I can't imagine it. Even in the grottiest part of the city, they, they're very nervous about letting something like that go. But we're sliding slowly, slowly towards that a little bit when you paint a lane yellow and pink and you have the mm. Korean music video shot in there. People go down into that lane and stand there. There's nothing 
you know, sometimes there's nothing there, but they're standing there, they're taking photos, they're posing. Um, that's a formalized kind of space, but mm -hmm. give it a little bit of time and someone will mark it and someone else will mark it and hopefully they don't clean it up. Mm -hmm. And one of the interesting things in Blood Alley Square, which I have the privilege of working on with um, consultants in the redesign is one of the things in the last meeting uh, that came up with the city was the sheer volume of graffiti that's been spray painted across the Stanley and New Fountain hotel walls. And the comment was, well, it's a pity to lose that because that's kind of cool. And so there the light bulbs went off in terms of, well, how do you preserve some of that graffiti? And then the next step will be, how do you bring new graffiti into the redesigned space? Well, that'll be part of the marketing campaign of Mr. Fight for Beauty, don't you think? <laughs> well, luckily the city's redesigning. Who is redeveloping that area. <laughs> but luckily the city's got the control over Blood Alley Square. Oh. But the question came up in terms of, well, can we preserve this mm -hmm. as it is really interesting art? And then that next question was, well, how do we, could we encourage graffiti? And so there is that kind of thought that, you know, in spots you should get grubby. Mm -hmm. But also I think Vancouver is very much like that new couch with the plastic on it. Mm -hmm. And you, you have to spill the coffee a few times before you loosen up and we're we haven't got there yet. Mm -hmm. Portland and its uh, west side, I think it's the band, uh, the west side uh, rail, uh, rail line, put uh, all the communities and uh, got funding from their, they have a 2% for art, and that went to the train station, so the communities got their own little design charrette and they hired artists. And so that's a model that we could do here where they actually bring in the local artists, the community, and they express themselves and they It'd be interesting, I haven't seen what they built, but it might be good to look at. Yeah, I mean, there has been a little bit of that in Vancouver, but it tends to be some very small project, sort of neighborhood grant kind of things, and pretty um, restrained, if I can use that word, um, community projects, little mosaics in the sidewalk and things like that, but good question. Um, who else? Yes, Leslie. Um, can we get the microphone down to? Um, I, I've got a, oh, okay. I'm, I'm very uh, interested in a lot of the ideas that are coming out of this. Um, yeah, I think that they're great. Uh, I, my question revolves around the city of Vancouver and its structure uh, politically. And uh, w what I'm interested in is um, there's the city of Vancouver and there's also the park board and they're both part of the city of Vancouver. However, their decisions are made uh, slightly separately. And so um, I'm curious, uh, given that other cities have different examples around this, and a lot of the examples that you've been talking about are plazas or those micro areas around streets, that's actually not park board area. And so um, how, do we, how do we actually unify these two separate governing bodies uh, within our city so that we have a, a better future for all of us. Okay, that's great. And if we could just make sure the microphone comes down to Leslie next. Um, so, uh, I know that um, uh, none of you are particularly political governance experts, <laughs> uh, but John does seem to you know, interact with the bureaucrats from time to time. Uh, it's partly more just historical accident in one sense. You have the incorporation of the city in 1886 with the city council, and then two years later you incorporate a parks board with an elected park board. And so two separate budgets, though budgets are linked. Um, Parks Board owns its own land, city owns its own land, and that's kind of how we've always done business. And it's interesting because there is crossover. Street trees are maintained by the Park Board, for instance. Um, we actually have one plaza, the weirdest one, which is that sort of escapee from the 1950 science fiction film down at Hastings and Seymour. That's a funny dome that echoes that's rusting and filled with blackberries and will soon be demolished. Uh, but that is actually a public park, which is a badly planned plaza, but it is actually a public park. Um, so there are those crossover spaces, but it's just a historical accident that we've had the two things and there's never been the energy or the wherewithal to change it. Um, you know, 99% of the time it actually works reasonably well. Um, I think it's where we carve off little corners to create 
one little burbling fountain and sort of there's our plaza and you know maybe choosing some better opportunities of collaboration but you know it's just it's just one of the things the way the city's grown up so I, I would just add that good stuff can happen in realms that aren't controlled by the parks board look at the work that's being done around public plazas in the west end for example um, this is about um, I guess it's, it's engineering or transportation or even the, and, and planning who are, who are all involved. So I, I would say maybe a crossover of ideas, um, but um, it can happen with, with, in other areas of responsibility. Yeah, and I think people in general have seen that engineering has really changed from what it was in the 60s and 70s when it was just like, how can we get the maximum number of cars through the city? Um, and um, they're actually quite innovative on, uh, in a number of areas. And, and if when things do happen in the streets with public plazas or the alleys or whatever, you have to get engineering on board and they, they do seem to be. So um, did anyone else want to respond to that? Or? Okay, uh, so you've got the microphone, yay, good. So thank you. Um, I just first wanted to say uh, that I think the organizers put together a really fantastic panel what I like very much is that you're all coming at this quite, from quite different angles. So I think in your presentations tonight, Charles and John, you've been talking about precedents and showing us other precedents and what's possible. Also Charles sort of thinking things forward, like what could happen on the edge of golf courses, for example. Bill, you're, you're showing us by example what designers can do when given the opportunity. And Larry, um, my question is really directed to Larry. You're showing us sort of academic studies uh, which try to quantify, um, to maybe make arguments from in that way uh, for, for changes to our, to our public spaces. And I found when you were talking particularly about your green prescription study and talking about how tree canopies reduce obesity and depression and so on, I found myself just feeling so skeptical and wondering, you, you've done a lot of work in health, and so I just don't understand how you control for all the other factors that affect people's well-being and are able to make an argument that tree canopies themselves can do that. And Charles, you've done also sort of evidence-based work, so you may want to address this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Leslie, for your question. <laughs> well, that's why if we knew everything, we uh, what did Einstein said, if I, if, if I knew what I was doing, I wouldn't call it research, <laughs> whatever. Um, the fact of the matter is we can isolate a relationship between phenomena, and that's what research does, as you know, being a professor at the university there. So the idea is that we can control for demographics, we can control for other factors, attitudinal predisposition, when you have enough there wouldn't be a study around on anything if we couldn't make inference about how one thing is related to another. So you try to tease out the effect of putting a train line in the ground, whether or not it affects whether or not people travel more by transit and are more physically active and healthier. We study people before and after things happen, and we study other people that don't have the benefit. It's called a randomized control trial, a case control. You compare people that get a drug to those who don't get the drug, and we do the same thing with urban development. So if people get a park and a green space, and others did not, they're the same in every way demographically, um, and the same in other ways, and then you isolate the effect of the change on their behavior, and you know what? We can't control for everything, but we wouldn't have, that's why we collect data on more than one person. We collect it on thousands of people. The data I showed you on the green space study had about, I think, eight to 10,000 people in the sample. But I don't think that the, fa the green trees don't make you thin. I raise questions very much as I presented it because I'm skeptical too. Like I know that people on nicer streets are wealthier that have better trees, and I know that that's not controlled for effect. We're getting into too much a scientific response, but the bottom line is that by and large, we're pretty confident because those studies get replicated over and over again and they have the same result. And when you get the same result repeated time and time again, you start to get kind of confident that something's going on. And when it makes intuitive sense, it really helps. 
Uh, and there was a, a book that came out just in the past year about like the, the impact of trees or nature. So I can't remember there, the name of it. I, I don't know what you think of it. There's a huge, there was a massive study done because of the pine beetle where there's a deforestation of most of North America. So that's a natural experiment and they studied the loss of tree canopy and that's a, that's a longitudinal over time study so that's causal. Evidence is really strong on health effects of greenery, but the evidence on air pollution filtration and on noise reduction isn't. And that's why I raise those concerns because I'm skeptical when there's no mechanism to effectively relate what it is you're trying to argue for in an outcome, we better not invest in that because it won't work. And as soon as we do, elected officials will get really angry because <laughs> we said that would work and it doesn't. Thanks. Um, were there other, any other hands up? I could take a, a couple more questions. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for a really fascinating discussion. It's amazing to have such great minds together. Um, I do have a question, but really quickly to uh, the British gentleman. Uh, there's some really important and fascinating street art being done around downtown East Side and in Chinatown. And one artist in particular, uh, Smokey D, who is doing basically public service announcements about the danger of fentanyl. They're memorials, they're human, and they're vulnerable. These are things that it's so frustrating to walk by and watch them get uh, painted over. So if there's anyone from the city who can do something about that, that would be the first thing to try and preserve, I think. So it's a really good stuff going on there. Um, you guys did a really great job uh, talking about the, the values of parks and the building blocks uh, on which almost all successful parks are based. Uh, since we're talking about the future of parks as well, I was curious uh, what role, if any, you think uh, digital devices should or could have. Um, could they make parks more accessible? Can they enhance the experience? Or is it something the city should just uh, stay away from? Thanks. Well, I think the recent uh, piece under the Canby Bridge shows what the digital will do. Uh, because there you have a, a playground, a hard surface. It's underneath the bridge at the northern, well, sort of the northeast end. and. There's no reason to hang out in that space, and yet you come down at 9.30 at night when the show was on, and there was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of folks huddled under the bridge waiting for the projections. And I think that kind of animation that's unexpected um, and done well helps enliven spaces. One of the things, going back to Blood Alley Square, we're playing with the same idea of projections on the ground, on the walls of some of the buildings that don't have windows. Um, it could be any number of different aspects of things. Uh, even lighting. Um, one of the key things that we've found within Blood Alley Square is that the lighting levels need to change at certain times of night because the concrete edges that we're, the designers are putting in are just wide enough to sleep on. But for certain times of night when folks are in the alley just using it as public space, you need one level of lighting. Once everyone goes home and people are trying to sleep, you want the lights to drop so it doesn't interrupt the REM sleep, uh, sort of cycle so they actually get a good night's sleep. And that's all done through the digital. So I think it plays a really big role in used intelligently in really interesting spaces, but I think it, it will really impact on many of our public spaces. Um, and I'm wondering if you also meant digital in the sense of maybe people using their smartphones to get information about uh, things around them in the park or things to, I don't know, games in the park. Or, or is it, were you thinking of that as well? Yeah. 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 So, um, I don't know if we've actually discussed this in the office, Mickey, but uh, in, it's, we're doing some work now for um, a report on uh, smart city technologies for building happy cities, and I'm really skeptical about it, but I, occasionally you get access to some really interesting um, conjecture, and uh, somebody wrote a really interesting piece about predictive uh, uh, predictive spaces and systems. So, okay, we're all walking around with these devices, we're all punching stuff in, we know uh, various uh, people are learning things about us, Facebook, Twitter, and, and elsewhere. Um, and the notion is that um, uh, system creators, whether it's a transportation system or a service provider, perhaps within a park could be able to harness that knowledge uh, to, to improve a system. So thinking of Stanley Park, for example, the Parks Board made a decision a couple decades ago, I might have been in the office with you, Francis, <laughs> to, to ban cars from Stanley Park by X date, which is coming fast, I believe. Um, 
well, what are we going to do when there's no cars are allowed in Stanley Park? And are we all going to wait in, in the rain for a bus that comes you know, once every 20 minutes or half an hour? Or can, we, can there be a predictive system and have small um, you know, autonomous shuttles zipping around the park to help us get around? I know that's, that's one possibility. Anyone else? No? Um, okay, uh, I can, was there one more question? And I, I think I'll make this the last one if that's okay with everybody. Uh, go ahead. In that case, I'm gonna cheat a little bit and make it a two-part question. Oh. Um, risky. Trickster. Um, the first one kind of speaks to a few of you talking about scale a little earlier that, you know, not to neglect smaller spaces. Uh, we have heaps of flat roofs here in the city, both industrial as well as uh, residential. Uh, has there been any talk about getting those spaces online as green roofs. Um, obviously, there's a bit of a messiness between privately owned buildings being used as public space, but uh, it just seems like such a waste when green roof technology is very mature in Europe and it's coming here rapidly, mainly in amenity spaces. So if maybe one of you could speak to that. And the second question is, uh, you guys are broad uh, representation of you know, both civic as well as research academia. What are the main venues or avenues that you guys get your, and girls, uh, get your ideas out to the people who make the decisions. So obviously there are public hearings, but are there other ways that the research and the ideas that come out of people who know, how do they make their way to the people who make the decisions in the halls of power? Thanks. Okay, so two very different questions, using green roofs, and secondly, um, non-politician city staff people, how do you get your ideas to the, to the, the people who actually make the decisions. So. Uh, I'm gonna start with your second question. Those are good questions. I don't know much about the green roof one, but um, an example of getting, is your question about how individuals or how anybody can get, I mean, what? what, what So um, as a researcher, I partner with end users all the time. So th right now we have a project. Uh, uh, um, Sam Caney's here, who represents the city of Vancouver, is our client. Um, we work with the city, the health authority, the TransLink, Metro, Real Estate Foundation, and partner. So that when we do a study, we actually listen to the end users first and figure out what they want. And then we try to maximize the benefit of data that we've already all collected and then try to use that to answer questions that they specifically have and then package the results in ways that people can understand it, which is usually the hardest thing to do. We can find out a lot of information, but the communication piece and getting it in the hand so that there's empowerment and understanding more so, and it answers a question a little bit before that I got, was that there's a cost of not knowing what's, what's helpful. In fact, we can make really bad mistakes by putting density, per, per, for example, near a lot of uh, sources of air pollution, you know, that, you know, a lot of traffic. So those are things we want to avoid the unintended. Thanks. Uh, anyone else? You've worked with city governments and... Yeah, I'd say we're... Just taking off, taking off from, from what Larry said, we're, we're kind of learning to do the same thing. We, uh, in fact, that's a whole basis of our work where we're, we're taking uh, kind of arcane knowledge, which thrills us, like Larry's work thrills us, um, but many researchers like Larry aren't seeing their knowledge put into practice. So uh, an example that we've done recently is uh, Patti Rios on our team essentially put together a toolkit. And this was around housing. How do, how do you build more sociable housing? So we did a meta review. We learned a bunch of things, uh, wrote a really boring white paper, and then realized, oh boy, you know, if we want anybody to act on this, we need to make a, a set of uh, flashcards for decision makers so they can just flip the card over, see the evidence, and then turn in the, uh, yeah, and look on the front of the card and say something really smart during a council meeting or when they're working with staff. Um, but I would say also, you know, it's not just the politicians making decisions. It's, it's, it's staff, it's bureaucrats, and it's also the people, developers in our community who are making change and NGOs and whatnot. And so um, I think the follow-on from that... Patty, are you here? Hey, up there with your crutches. Um, the follow-on from that is to create a cohort of people to act on that knowledge to create policy change. So I think right now you've created a, a cohort uh, uh, with the support of the Real Estate Foundation of developers, health uh, public health professionals, planners, and staff at various municipalities to figure out, well, what are the policy blocks to change? 
And I think you're getting going in the next month, aren't you? Yeah. Right. And then when you did, when you came out with that information, you found a developer also to do, who was working on a housing project um, that you could use as an example. Because that's often what people need. They need to see, like, someone did this and it worked. Yeah. That's right. Um, anyone on the green roofs? Um, I would take the green out of it. Um, because I don't think you need to go the green roof thing to create public space and the use of space. Um, London, for instance, has rooftop cinema clubs where, you know, you climb up to the top of the roof and you've got a screen up there and you sit and you watch movies out in the summer evenings. Uh, we've got a few still standing above ground parking garages where the upper floors, one of them was a failed greenhouse experiment. Uh, but you've got these sort of great opportunities for use of space just in terms of activity. Uh, maybe the top floor of the Woodward's parking garage becomes a soccer pitch or something like that. Um, I don't think we need to go planting things all the time. I think the notion of the park needs to be slightly different in terms of just active use, passive use, but using spaces differently. And so that recreation side of it could be just something like watching a film or it could be playing soccer on the rooftop of a parking garage. So I think green, not necessarily, but the use of alternative spaces, definitely. Anyone else? No? Okay, um, those were wonderful questions and, and great audience, by the way. I wasn't expecting so many people, so it was nice to see a pretty full crowd here. Um, and a wonderful panel. Uh, I, 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 as I said, I love parks, but I felt like I sort of had my mind stretched in various ways tonight about the possibilities of parks and who you should take into account um, when you're thinking about them and so on. So um, I, this was a wonderful exercise in imagination.